are all excited today because we have a break next week. And so everybody's wigging out on me. And also yesterday was the official first day of spring. Just by second, it was the 19th. I know. Very odd. Yeah, 06. I thought it was 06 last night. Yes. Uh, so despite the fact that it's crummy outside, it is spring. Uh, so today. Very nice. No, it's not, actually. Okay, guys. I want to hear you later, but not yet. Okay. Um, did anybody bring an outline uh, for their literary analysis? No, no. Mm. Oh. That I haven't looked at yet. I'm translating. Oh. You tra is that, does that mean better handwriting? Yeah. Okay. Um, you can show it to me after class if you want to, Nathan. Uh, Jay, did you said you brought one? Oh, I mean, do you want me to take a look at it? Oh, you're not supposed to give it to me. You're supposed to have it because you're going to write the paper this week. So make sure you have it. I've got papers for you guys. Um, Nathan and Asher, we're all very excited today. What is what I'm talking about? Can they replace it? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Do we know who's that old? Don't know. Yes, I looked it up. Oh, right. and, we looked and, and where did you look it up? Uh, we looked it up in six different places. Okay, well, yeah. I'm, I have trouble arguing with that, although I wasn't aware that Cole came up with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is awesome. I really enjoyed your characters, JJ, I have yours on top, that you created. Everybody pretty much gave me what I asked for. Um, uh, if you are still, if you were the people, if you're one of the people who still hasn't, um, been putting in, oh, John, you said here. Uh, oh, you said Xavier John, didn't you? Um, if you're not putting in your alliteration and strong verb and parallelism and marking it for me, please do so. It makes it so much easier for me. But I was really, these were very fun to read. And you guys are interested in the slide. I got a beautiful job. Okay, I was going to ask All right. Oh, no, I have one edit. So I would like everybody, we're going to barrel ahead because I have a lot of stuff I want to talk about today. Uh, go ahead and get your reading guides out. But first, this is the Nathan. Nathan. Because we have visitors. I don't want to have to start moving people to other sides of the table. You don't want to be that person. Um, this is the last art that I think I'm going to bring in for the year. Of our, Ren our look at Renaissance art. And um, this artist is really cool. Andrea Montaigne. After seeing this last week, I think it's cool. Okay, yes. Byron Massage is. He's not as interesting as that. <coughs> All right. Um, does everybody, how many of you would dabble in art? Do some sketching, painting? Okay. So you guys are familiar with the idea that because of <clears throat> what is called perspective, because of the way our eyes see things, when we draw them, we do not always draw them in the same shape they actually are in reality, because if we do, it won't look like reality. For instance, this is a very long table, two tables. And from my perspective here, this end is wider than the other end. The sides go like this. Are you familiar with this idea? So things that are farther away get smaller. It's like standing on train tracks, you know? And it looks, you know, if the train tracks don't meet. It's bad for the train if the train tracks meet. This is not good. So you know the train tracks don't meet, but they seem to meet as they move into the distance. So, you know, we have these clever ways when we draw of um, allotting for that and making it look like it looks in reality. Now, tables are pretty easy because it's an easy shape. But things like human beings, do you know, if a human being were lying in a bed and you were drawing them from the feet to the head, you know, and then you started measuring your drawing, the feet would be bigger than it seems like they should be respective of the head, right? So this idea of foreshortening, this idea of using perspective to produce what our eyes really see, 
but we know isn't really true. We know the head isn't that much smaller than the feet. This is what this artist was great at. He experimented with this a lot. And I brought in a couple of paintings. I'm not going to walk around just for time constraints, but I will leave them here if you want to watch them close up as you leave. Um, this one is an adoration of the shepherds. The shepherds have come to see Jesus. And um, uh, the, the notable figure here is the baby Jesus. You know, it's, it's just so much easier to draw something head on or from the side, but when you have angles and when you have that foreshortening, it's difficult. So you've got Jesus here, and um, and Joseph also, his legs are kind of sprawled forward towards us, and his upper body is leaning away. It's very tricky to draw something like this. So this is, this is one example, but a better example is the other picture I brought, which is uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, I know this is far away for some of you, but I will leave them here. Um, Jesus is praying. Um, this is very apropos because we're going into Easter. Um, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we see Judas and the soldiers coming up the path. But take a look at the disciples sleeping. Look at this one. His feet are towards us. And his head is away. Very, very tricky. And if you are an artist, you might say, well, it's not tricky. I've, I've been learning this the whole time. But this is a new concept. Remember those Byzantine, very stiff pictures we looked at at the beginning of the year? That's what, that's what art was in East and West before the Renaissance. And so people like Montaigne who are, who are experimenting with this, um, th this is a difficult concept. Uh, I like his art, too. Do you notice anything similar about these two? In, in in what way are they similar? Hang on, what do you see? Like, like gold, like, like lines, like plain colors. Plain, plain colors. I like the, the earth, I guess we call them earth tones. We have some oranges. There's a little bit of blue splashed here. But these dark earth tones, um, if you come up, if you have a chance to look at them, there's little details too. There's a little rabbit running up the road here for, for no reason, just because he's there. There's, there's little birds down uh, on the road on the side. Uh, so uh, if you think this is cool, look him up. He's got a very famous picture, which I don't have a copy of, of um, Jesus, the body of Jesus off the cross, but it's right from his feet. If his feet are right there in front of you and his head is back in the distance, and it really okay. accentuates so, like, that foreshortening. Is the cross like, that, like, well, no, the he's not on the cross anymore like in the picture. He's um, laying, he's laying on the ground, I think. But, oh, oh. But, but, but he's laying there. But it's, it's not, you know, looking at him from the side. It's looking at him from his feet. And it's just, it's astounding. So I will put these out. Take a look. And I'll put one here. And I'll put one here if you want to on the way out. Okay. So, we have some tough stuff to talk about today. Um, we're going to be in your reading guide on page um, 57, is where your questions are. Today, we're going to talk about the third important element of our year. First semester, we talked about the Middle Ages. And up until today, we've spent a lot of time talking about the Renaissance. But today, we're going to talk about the beginning of the Reformation. What, what do we mean? Do you, do you want me to ask the question first? Yeah. Are you reading my mind? Do you know what's the, yeah, what do we mean by the Reformation? What is the Reformation? That was going to be my question. But did you have a different comment? No. If so, okay. Well, then go ahead. So the Reformation was whenever they kind of realized something mm -hmm. wrong, something wrong in the church was mm -hmm. not, um, it was turning corrupt. So they just kind of put a stop to it and created Protestant. And a, lot of and a lot of things happen. That's kind of going. My first question will spring more off what Nathan said. Yeah, Haley. Is there like, is there like, is there like, is there like, the thing we need to remember when we talk about this is we live in a weird world where we think it's normal for there to be all sorts of kinds of churches. 
I bet when you came here, I can't even imagine how many different sorts of churches you drove past. The church I teach at on Tuesdays, there's three different kinds of churches within a block. You know, different denominations. And we're just used to it. And so the first thing I want you to do is use your imagination to a time when there was only one church. It's not quite accurate because there was the Eastern Church that had broken away in 1054 in that schism. But in the West, in Europe, there was one church. If you were a Christian, you went to the church. There's only one church. And we're just so used to it not being that way that we can't imagine what that would be like. You're a Christian, so there's your church. Um, you don't shop around for a church. You don't have choice. There's your church. Um, we talked two weeks ago about um, um, developments in astronomy that sort of blew people's minds, right? Oh my goodness. Do you mean there are moons going over Jupiter? What? What? Then last week we talked about the fact that there were people living on the other side of the world, for crying out loud, with different kinds of food and different clothes and different languages doing their thing. And then people's heads explode a little bit more. You guys need to remember this is happening at the same time. I feel like the people that lived between 1450 and 1550 had a tough road up, oh, as they say. It was really, really hard because everything was changing. We, we think about today, you know, things change all the time. We laugh because, you know, I talk about my childhood and it sounds like the Stone Age to you guys. There were no VCRs, and, uh, none of all, no computers, no internet, none of this stuff. Um, and so there's been a lot of change. I, I mentioned once my grandpa was born in 1917. Do you remember this talk? And um, he died in, in, in 2010. And so he saw, he went from, when he was born, they were just using airplanes in World War I, like the Red Baron sort of thing, okay. to the moon landing, to, to the internet. What? It was my grandpa's life. He, he lived through all of those things. And, and I feel like this might have been a similar time. When you were born, you knew that the Earth was in the center of the solar system. And you knew that there was no land on the other side of the world. It was just water. And you knew that there was one church and there would always be one church forever. And you suddenly, you know, you're an old person. All of those things are changed. So I'm just, this is my preface to none of what we're going to talk about. This all seems old to us. Like, yeah, 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 we know. We know. And there's all these churches. But it wasn't like that before. There was only one church. So Nathan said, people started realizing there were problems. The first question I asked you guys was name a few of the problems which led to growing discontent with the church. Maybe you have one. Yeah, Nathan. Oh, that was unfairness and greed in the church. Okay. Do you want to, what, what do you mean by unfairness? Um, well, I thought they would, the priests would like some money and they would become super rich. They would, which leads to your second, the, the rich part, the wealthy part, right? Yes. Do you remember? Did we talk about this? That might have been the high school kids. People would pay to become bishop. Oh, right? They, they, you sort of auctioned it off. Sometimes they were eight or nine years old, and you just paid for your son to be bishop. Why do you want to be bishop? Because you make money from it. Does anybody know the name of that particular sin? It has a fun history. Buying church offices is called buying them. Because the very first person to try to do it was Simon in the book of Acts. Simon saw that the apostles laid their hands on believers and they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon said, ooh, that's awesome. How much money can I give you so I can do that? Peter said, I don't think so. No, he said, may your money perish with you. The gift of God cannot be bought with money. But they kind of started thinking it could, you know. And so being a priest or a bishop or a cardinal, this is the gift of God, but they were buying this money. So that they could make more money. It was very twisted. 
Um, did anybody find another problem that Dorothy knows? Anybody? Let's give somebody else a chance. But if Nathan, no one wants it, Nathan, it's all yours. Oh, oh, do you have another one? If they were asking them, like, uh, that it pay to get out of this middle section between heaven. Indulgences. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. let's hold on to that because that's the biggie and that's one of my other questions. But that's very good, very good. You got another one besides indulgences? Yeah. Go for it, Nathan. Um, Oh, wait, never mind. It's not in the church. I was going to say. Oh, okay. Well, Zach is going to save you. Um, I guess I do. It said, mm -hmm. being called a heretic, if you didn't give the priest one tenth of your stuff before Easter or your produce. Okay. All right. Did they, did she, Dorothy Mills actually say, yeah. She said, okay. Um, let me read Let me read this. Uh, it can expand on what Zach said. Uh, not just tithing, but just taxes. And Nathan just said this too under his breath, I heard him say taxes taxes in general listen to what this person this is from the time this is a dorothy mills talking this is someone from that time i see that we can scarcely get anything from christ ministers but for money at baptism money at bishoping money at marriage money for confession money no not extreme unction without money by the way extreme unction is your anointing and prayer when you're dying this is pretty important because we can't even get that without money they will ring no bells without money, no burial in the church without money, so that it seemeth that paradise is shut up from them that have no money. Yeah, or that's a repetition fallacy. I think it was uh, like what? What do you mean? Uh, it's from Yeah. What? What? What is? What is? No, and it's like they're trying to prove a point by saying the same thing over and over and over again. But oh, it's, and it's not. The, okay, I'm going to break in. It's not the same thing over and over again. It's also a figure of speech. It's a rhetorical figure of speech. So it's not, I think it would only be a fallacy if um, you did say the same thing. But he's saying baptism, marriage, confession. He's making a list. And that's actually a rhetorical figure of speech. So watch watch out between the two. But that's good. That's good that you noticed. That's good that you noticed. Um, yes, you had to... You had to um, uh, give a certain amount to the church. Now, aren't we supposed to give a certain amount to the church? Yes. If none of it mine. If I can't at least give 10% of it to the church, I'm that's kind of sorry. Um, but they were taxed and forced to, and the church would not minister to them if they didn't do it. Do you see the difference? Like voluntarily bringing my things to God because I love him. And because he gave me everything I have anyway, versus being told they have to do it. Did we find another one? I think I found another one. And it might not have registered with you because you might not know what it was talking about. Does anybody know what the great schism is? Whenever the Catholic Church split and it turned into Protestant and Catholic? No. Oh. No, no. Haley, I'll give you a shot. No, no. Uh, this is something that happened way before the Reformation, and it made the church look bad. Let me tell you the story. It's 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 a bad and ugly story. So once upon a time, there's a guy, and he was the Pope, and he was French. And the French said, "We like having a French Pope. We like it so much. We're just gonna move him to France." Let's just let's just keep him in France, and then all the money that goes to the Pope, it'll just stay in France. It won't go to Rome. We like that, and so they set up a Pope's palace in Avignon, which is in southern France. And for seventy-ish years or so, the Popes lived in France. We talked about this a little bit because remember this is hundred years war, and the English were kind of ticked off because they were sending money to the church, but the church was in France, and France was their enemy, and this was messed up. So finally, the, the, they moved the Pope back to France, but people did not like who the Pope was. And a group of them got together and had a council and say, we're deposing him and electing a new Pope. Great, except the first guy didn't want to stop being Pope. So people have to decide which one is legit. This was intolerable. So a bunch of bishops got together. We're calling the council and we're fixing this. And they said, you two, you're not Pope. We elected a new one, but they didn't want to stop. And, <laughs> and so everybody, like, which one? 
which which one do I follow? Which one do I trust? I don't know. It was a horrible scandal. If you have one person that is supposed to be the head of the church, and now we have three of them, and they don't agree with each other, if I'm just an average Joe and I can't do my research, I don't know who's legitimate, and I don't know who's legitimate, it's a terrible scandal. So people started asking questions like, well, if there can be three guys pope at the same time, why should I even trust him when there's one? Maybe I shouldn't. So things were bubbling under the surface. Finally, they did get it taken care of, and we were back to one. But people did not forget that this happened, right? And it was very, very ugly. Okay, back to what was mentioned earlier. What doctrine or practice did Luther want to address when he nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg church door? Just say it, everybody. The greedy people. Awesome. Yes. So here's the deal. Because pro the Protestant world looked at this and they just sort of sneered. But this is not based on something that's unreasonable. So let me explain. Say I rob a bank. Do not. But wow. and then I'm very, very sorry, as I should be. I, I don't look like this word. I'm very sorry now, though. And so I go and I tell God that I am sorry. Please forgive me. Will God forgive me for robbing the bank? Yes. Mm -hmm. But may I still go to prison? Yes. In fact, I probably should turn myself in if I'm really sorry and, and pay the penalty and give the money back. So God will forgive me my sin, but my sin may still have consequences. Do you see the difference? If I punch someone, God will forgive me, and hopefully they will forgive me, but, well, I couldn't do this because I'm not strong enough, but if I were like Rocky, I could send them to the ER. They're still going to be hurt. Saying I'm sorry doesn't heal the hurt of the fact that I punched him, you see. My sin has consequences. So this is the misunderstanding for a lot of Protestants. Indulgences have nothing to do with sin. God forgives sin. Indulgences have to do with consequences. So the whole idea of purgatory um, is that our sins have consequences and we don't always they don't all play out in this life. And sometimes they play out in the next life. Sometimes I still have a taint of the problems that sin causes in me. I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm just explaining what it is. Okay. Um, indulgences were a gift of the church to you to remit some of the consequences of your sin. Not sin. The consequences in this life or presumably in the next life. And uh, originally, it was a, a deal where you needed to be, well, obviously sorry for what you did. And you need to do something to make amends. For example, remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. Um, and he climbed the tree. And do you remember what he said he would do? He, he, said, he said Jesus had come to his house, and he said, if I have defrauded anyone, I'm going to do what? Do you know what Zacchaeus said he was going to do? Pay back yeah. I will return fourfold. And you know what? He made his living cheating people. So this very well made him. He might be broke. You know what I mean? Or in debt if, if he carried this out. He made what we would call restitution. Right? He made up for his sin. Like Jesus forgives him for bilking people, but now he needs to do something about it. Right? So originally the church said, well, you need to do something about it. You need to you know, if you stole, give it back. If you hurt someone, do kind things for them now. You need to do something. But eventually, eventually it morphed into this weird thing where you could just give money and get the remission of the consequences. You see the difference? The difference between I'm very sorry and like Zacchaeus, I'm going to, you know, give back everything I stole and heal the people I have harmed versus here has some money. Now I'm going to go on my merry way and do whatever I want. And this is what he had turned into. So there's this guy, and his name is Tetzel. Oh, first of all, I need to ask, tell you why they're raising money. 
They're building St. Peter's in Rome. They're building a new church in Rome and building churches across Rome. So they're raising money. The church is raising money. And they said, hey, we'll send people out through Europe and they will sell these indulgences, these remission of the effects of one's sin in the, in the future life mm -hmm. for money. Now, presumably, it wasn't supposed to be just money. In most cases, it was you need to go to the priest and you need to confess and, and money was involved. But this guy, Tetzel, was off the rails, as far as we can tell. He was just a kind of a loose cannon, as they say. He was doing his own thing. And he was roaming through Germany, just collecting money and just whipping indulgences out of his pocket left and right. And he had a little poem that he was saying. And before I give you the poem, I have to tell you that a coffer, a coffer is a box to put money in. Okay? This little poem is, when once coin in coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Like, just drop a coin. Just drop a coin. Bing, bing. And they're just bringing out a purgatory left and right. This is not what the church thought. How did we just do stuff? But he was making a lot of money. So Luther got wind of this. Tesla was in Luther's neighborhood. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. That sounds highly suspicious to me. So Luther did what people used to do if you were a college professor. You made a list or a statement of something you thought should be discussed, and you nailed it to the door. It wasn't a weird thing to do. Everybody nails stuff to the door. It's like a bulletin board, right? So if you want to discuss whether or not you should have pizza for lunch here every week, you know, we'll put this up for discussion. You just, but don't nail anything to the door here. But, you know, you would just nail it up somewhere. You'd pack it to a bulletin board and say, this is, a, this is something that should be discussed here. That's what Luther did. He had an advantage that he wouldn't have had 100 years before. <coughs> He wrote out his 95 theses, theses, uh, points of discussion, most of which were about indulgences. He wrote them out and passed them to the door. Now, if somebody else wanted a copy of it, did they have to take it down and copy it out by hand anymore? In 1570, no. what could they do now? Printing press. So 100 years before, to get these spread, people would have had to copy them down by hand. Now, you take it to the local printing press, you got 2,000 copies. So, and you're sending them to your friends and neighbors, and it spread like wildfire. It spread to the nobleman that was in charge of Luther's area of Germany. And Luther's thinking, oh, you're going to do something about this, right? I'm sorry to report that guy was getting kickbacks from Tesla. Tesla was paying. I'm smiling. You can see it. The nobleman in charge of Luther's area is being paid by Tesla to allow Tesla to do this in his area. He's not going to shut it down. Whether it's theologically correct or not, he's not going to shut it down. He's making money off of it. Luther didn't know. So he sent it to this guy. Oh, we should do something about this. And he's, the nobleman says, yeah, yeah, we'll see. And then he doesn't do anything. Um, Let's talk a little bit about Luther. She didn't tell me much about Martin Luther. Martin Luther was going to be a lawyer. He's super duper smart, and his dad bought him a bunch of law books to send him to law school. And he was traveling through the mountains once, and it was a big storm. And if you've ever been out in a pretty bad storm, like, you know, it's fine when you're inside and looking out the window. I'm like, oh, a storm. But if you're out in it and there's no shelter, and that rain is pelting on you, and it hurts when the rain is coming up. And then lightning is striking things in your general vicinity. And there's nowhere to go. It's scary. And he was scary. And he called out, God, if you will save me, I will become a monk. And lightning did hit him. And he listened to the story. So he went home and he gave away or sold his law books. And he told his dad, I'm becoming a monk. And his dad said, Are you nuts? He said, no, well, I promised. I promised I would be come up. It's quite probable that Luther was never very suited to be a monk, but he made the deal and he felt like he just kept the deal. So he went to a monastery and um, he had a problem believing that God loved him. 
He didn't believe God forgave his sins. He just couldn't believe it. And he just tried harder and harder. You know, he fasted more and more, and he stayed up later and later, and he read his Bible more and more and more. And he went to the abbot, to the leader of the monastery. And even the abbot said, Luther, this is not a direct quote, you need to chill. God loves you. You do not have to hurt yourself for God. Just follow him. Love him. Forgive you. But Luther had something going on and he couldn't accept it. So, um, yeah, let's move to the next question. We'll, we'll, we'll keep following Luther's life and what happened in history together. How did Luther respond to the papal order? They call it a bull. Excommunicating him. Hey, he, he just torched it. He publicly torched it in front of everyone. This is what I think of the Pope's orders. Now, after you burn a letter from the Pope publicly, there's kind of no going back from that. It's kind of a declaration of war. But up until that moment, there was still a chance. So, <clears throat> Lutheran, we're going to call them the Lutherans because that's what they started calling themselves. The Lutheran ideas started spreading, and the emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, got wind of it. Guess who the emperor is? Our old friend Charles V, that we keep talking about over and over. The guy who's the king of Spain, and the king of the Netherlands, and the Holy Roman Emperor. And his aunt, Catherine of Aragon, got divorced by Henry VIII. And same guy. And he said, okay, we need to find out what's happening in Germany here. Let's call a meeting. Let's call Luther to come give an account of himself and what he's written. Fine. So they send Luther a message and they say, we promise we will keep you safe. Well, you come and you say your thing and you can go home in peace. We will not hurt you. Well, that sounds very nice, but not very long before, there's been a man named Hutt, John Hutt. And they said the same thing to him. And they invited him to come talk, and then they threw him in prison and killed him. Oh. You know, they said they weren't going to do that. So Luther's friends said, you don't want to do this. And he said, well, I'm going to do it, because it's, it's my chance to have my say. But uh, if I don't come back, keep fighting the good fight. He knew there was a chance. So he went, and they did actually. Charles V let him come and let him go in peace. And they showed him all his writings, and they said, do you still believe this? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And unless you can prove to me this is wrong, and this is what I believe. And they let him go. Now, they let him go, but he was on the way home, and he suddenly just disappeared. And everybody yeah. said, oh, Charles kidnapped him and killed him. No, his friends kidnapped him. His friends kidnapped him. They said, look. The world is not fit for you anymore. They're going to come for you. You know they're going to come for you. So we're going to hide you in this castle. Where sometimes you will go out in disguise. Disguise as a peddler. And just kind of roam the streets. Let me, let me keep going, Haley, so I can keep my train of thought. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so they did. They kept him there for 18 months. In, in which time he wrote a, uh, a copy of the, the Bible, the New Testament, in German. Um, and I just want to throw in there, there were 17 other copies of the Bible in German already. It, it, this is also a, something that people think, oh, the church would not let you translate the Bible into your language. This is not true. There were already a bunch of them. Luther, Luther made a new copy because he, I'm just going to say it, he translated in ways, he chose words yeah. that made it sound like he was right. You know, when you translate things, you have choices about words, and he phrased it in ways that made it sound like he was right. But that's what he did while he was in the castle. And then in the meantime, he would dress up as a peddler, you know, and run around. And he found out that in his absence, guys back home in Wittenberg, they were going a little bonkers with him. Luther, at first, I don't even think he wanted to split with the church. You know, he just wanted to fix things. Then he starts burning people orders. Eh, it's a little hard to go back on that. <clears throat> but the people that were his companions and followers, they just started ripping churches apart, ripping all the pictures out of churches, just changing things. And he would he would show up in his peddler, you know, outfit. He said, What have I done? What have I 
just started. Were you people nuts? I didn't mean for you to do this. But sometimes when you start something, it's like pushing a you know, little snowball down the hill. And it gathers more snow, and at the end, it just takes out your parents' shed or something like that. You know, it becomes huge. And this is what happened to Luther. One of the unpleasant, and this is the next question I ask you, what, une what unexpected and unpleasant results did Luther's teachings on equality have? He said things like, all men are created equal. Uh, peasants revolted because peasants don't like how the world is. Mm -hmm. So all the poor people just decided, well, Luther has given us permission to murder noblemen and steal their stuff. I heard it. No. No. In fact, I got to read this exactly because I love the title of this book. Luther wrote a little pamphlet. He wrote a pamphlet called Against, Against the Murdering, Thieving Hordes of Peasants. <laughs> really like that. that. I guess the murdering, thieving horde of peasants. Uh, and he told the uh, powers of Germany, we need to suppress this with the work of necessary. If you have to kill them, so we can't have stuff like this. Luther, you know, we have to be very careful when we say all men are created equal. Our Declaration of Independence says it, right? But we know it's not really true in every instance. I'm not very tall. and. I'm never going to be a basketball player, as I've pointed out many, many times in this class. Uh, I am not equal to, you know, the six, just come on, we'll just throw one under the bus, somebody tall. Um, we're not all equal in many, many ways, but in this country, we're equal under the law, presumably, right? If we're accused of something, we have equal rights under the law. And when this is all equal, he meant we're equal in God's eyes. We're equally sinners. And we're equally worthy of forgiveness, right? Not we all should have the exact same amount of money in the bank. And but this is the peasant's thought. Communism. Yeah, that, that's what they wanted. That's what they, they, that's what, if other people have things that I don't have, it seems very unfair to me, right? And it was when it was just sharing with the whole people. It doesn't seem so fair to the people to have it, right? So poor Luther. I feel a little sorry for him. On the one hand, he did get what he wanted. He started a movement that shed light on the problems in the church. On the other hand, he didn't get what he wanted. He didn't mean for certain ideas to be carried so far. But one thing is for sure. After Luther, the church is never going to be the same. In the West, there are now two groups of Christians. And whatever, like... Many of my students, I think most of you here are Protestant, most of my students on other days are Catholic. It doesn't matter which side you're on, we should all equally say, that's just wrong. Because Jesus prayed, one of the last things he prayed is, let them be one. Because I am a father of one. We're not one. And that's a bad thing. And I think all, we, we should all agree. But, on the other hand, there are things that need to fix it. Um, I'll throw this in too. There were people already trying to do the fixing from the inside. Um, there were people, do you remember our friend Erasmus, the yeah. humanist writer who wrote The Praise of Folly and he dissed the church horribly, and, but he wouldn't join Luther, right? We learned in the chapter about Erasmus. He wouldn't join Luther because he didn't think that the church should be broken in pieces. He said, we need to fix it from inside. And Luther, his perspective was it's too broken to fix from the inside. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to change things. But so whichever side you know your family or your tradition is on, it's twisted that we have many, many churches and we're not just all Christians. Um, but uh, so Luther Luther um, was he did not help his Cause by being a little bit snarky and grumpy. I don't know how else to say it. And insulting. Um, uh, the guy that we read about in the next chapter, uh, I only asked about Calvin, but let me talk about Zwingli. This guy named Zwingli in Switzerland. And he said, I love this, I love Luther. I love, I love this reformer stuff. I'm going to start it here in Switzerland. And you know what? We're just going to go to war and we're going to kill everybody that doesn't agree with us. 
Mr. Quigley, no. Uh, so he did and he died in the battle. And Luther said, well, he got what he deserved. Um, Luther wasn't always very polite. He left the monastery and he married a nun, a lady who had been a nun, because after there's no Catholic church, there were no monasteries, and the poor nuns had no other means of support. You know, there wasn't a time when there were, was employment for women. So you were married or you were a nun, or you lived with your parents. Those were your choices, and they were thrown out of work, sort of, if you had been a nun. So he married one of them. Um, yeah, and he lived to see his ideas spread and spread and spread, but not everybody agreed with his ideas. Some people wanted to tweak them. Zwingli was one. And the last question I asked you about John Calvin. In what city did Calvin work, and what kind of city did he organize there? Where is Calvin's famous city? Geneva. Geneva, Geneva Switzerland. Um, and uh, so here's Calvin's story. Calvin was French. And the French Protestants were called Huguenots. I once tried to look up. Oh, that's an odd word. And I could not, nobody seems to know why they called them Huguenots. But that's what they called them, French Protestants, Huguenots. It wasn't very safe to be a Huguenot because the king was Catholic and he will, you know, persecute you. So uh, Calvin was sort of becoming Lutheran and uh, wrote a speech for a friend or maybe wrote a speech. People thought he did kind of slam in the church and people said, oh, Calvin wrote that. And he ran for it. He ran north. And he just wanted a little place where he could read his book and write his book and sip his tea and no one would bother him. I feel for him. I also just want a place where I can read my book and sip my tea. This is all I want. So he showed up in Geneva to spend one night. And the guy in charge of the reforming movement in, in Geneva was named Farrell. And Farrell, William Farrell, came to Calvin that night and he said, John Calvin, God has sent you here for a purpose. God wants you to take over the church in Geneva and Start, you know, the reforming movement here, and if you leave and you don't do it, God will punish you for your disobedience. He did. He says this to him. Well, Calvin stays, because when somebody says that to you, it makes you rethink your plans. So he stayed. He spent the rest of his life in Geneva. For a while, he tried to change things, and then they threw him out, because they didn't like the way he was changing things, and then things went to pop. So they said, Mr. Calvin, will you please come back? What kind of city did he want Geneva to be? Can you describe what life was like in Geneva? Yeah, well, we wanted to establish a free city, I guess. Okay, a free, free, it depends on your definition of free, maybe. Nathan, do you want to add to that? Yeah, yes, politically free. But what was it like for the people who lived there? Well, that's a good question. Are you looking at 57? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, a city that was like governed by God's rules. Okay. And what happens to you if you don't follow the rules? You get punished. Oh, you get punished. But are they all only God's rules? Let me read some of them and then you decide. All luxury was forbidden. Public festivals were banned. No dancing was allowed at weddings. Feasts for too many people or on too lavish a scale were forbidden. Clothes might not be made of forbidden materials or fashion. No one might laugh at any sermon by Calvin or speak angrily of him in the street. These things were not only forbidden by law, but any infringement of them was punished with ruthless severity. You know, it does, Warren, but people just kept going to Geneva. Like this, this, this kind of takes it off my tour, but people, Locked to Geneva. They wanted to work with this man. They wanted to train with him and find out how to do the same thing in their homes. One notable man who did this that we're going to read about maybe next week, week after is John Knox. He came from Scotland and he said, I want to get up to date on all the Calvin's ideas so I can take them back to Scotland. And the, what I described might sound very much like the Puritans in England to you, if you know anything about the Puritans, who 
you couldn't celebrate Christmas. Um, they closed down all the theaters, you know, like a, not movie theaters, obviously, but like Shakespearean plays, stage plays. They closed them all down because they think they were wicked. Sometimes they were. Um, this came from John Knox. It filtered down from Scotland. Um, and the Puritan movement grew because, as we'll find out in a couple weeks, eventually England's going to get a king from Scotland. Um, and he's going to bring the Venus companion to their thing, certainly he is with them. Uh, so yeah, despite the fact that it doesn't sound like a place any of us really wants to live, uh, people kept coming there because they thought it was the only way to have a truly Christian city. Now, I'm just going to ask you guys your opinion. Is there a... Sh should... Okay, let's start with this. All the things on that list, if you can remember, did you did you hear any of them that you feel like should be okay? Like that just aren't a sin at all in any way? Let me read some of them again. All luxury forbidden, public festivals banned, no dancing at weddings, no feast for too many people. You can't have too fancy food at your feast. What do you think? But, we're we're not allowed we're not allowed to have too many people and have too good. I this is Mrs. Ferguson's opinion. Inside my heart and my mind say, who are you to tell me that? God doesn't tell me it. They feasted all the time in the Bible. The the marriage feast of the Lamb in Revelation. How how can you tell me that? Or in China? Uh, I feel like no dancing at weddings. Indeed. <laughs> you suffered through the whole ceremony and all the speeches and everything just to wait for the music to start. I know. I know. What do you think, David? To go off what he said, because in the Bible, it, I think it was Jesus' first miracles that they were at a wedding for like three days and yeah. they didn't have any more wine. And they were drinking wine. And they were drinking plenty of it. <laughs> they ran out. Um, uh, so Nathan, you want to chime in with something? Luxury. I like luxury. You know, here's a this problem with luxury. Who decides what is luxury? Do you see, you see what I mean? Because, for example, I don't know how many of you, maybe some of you are, you do not have to raise your hand. This is for you to think in your own head. Um, some of you might be pretty wealthy by American standards. I will just out myself. I'm very average. I'm not going hungry. I don't need anything, but I buy clothes at Goodwill and, you know, and I go to Aldi. You know, I work kind of in the middle. But compared to many other people living in other places of the world, I do live in luxury. You see what I mean? It's a little bit of a relative term, we would say. Compared to most people throughout history, probably everybody in this room lives in luxury. Compared to, you know, Dirt floors. Well, you have half of that then. Yes, but, but not everybody, Haley. Not everybody. Like 99% of the people probably lived in conditions much worse than anybody in this room. So luxury is sort of a relative term. So now we have to create a council in Geneva to decide what is luxury. Like cotton is okay, but silk is not okay. Okay, you know, linen isn't okay, but you can wear wool. Arbitrary. It's hard when we start making rules for other people because then we end up being kind of arbitrary. Does that make sense to you guys? It's really difficult to do that. So, so this is what they were doing in Geneva. Um, Calvin was not, and I, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm airing the dirty laundry of the reformers, and I'm just trying to give a fair, because in in the Protestant world, you know, most idea is that these guys were just like the equivalent of saints, and, and they could do no wrong, but, you know, there's enough wrong to go around sometimes on both sides. The church was doing things terribly wrong. Some of the reformers were things terribly wrong. Uh, a guy showed up in Geneva who was uh, a heretic, and he was a heretic. I do denying the Trinity, that sort of heretic. And they burned him at the stake <coughs> in, in Geneva. This People still look down on Calvin for this. Calvin, you wrote some awesome stuff and you did awesome work in the church. He burned that guy at the stake. He said, yep, execute 
creating these dangers. Um, this is the beginning of the Reformation. I've told you a kind of a rocky, I don't know, up and down story. Um, the bad things that happen, did they intend them to happen? I don't think so, not at all. The bad things did happen. Um, so today, the world, the Western world, is still kind of divided, right, between Protestants and Catholics. And in the Catholic view, this is sort of the worst thing that ever happened to the church because it ripped apart something that should never have been ripped apart. And in the Protestant world, it tends to be seen as one of the best things that ever happened in the church because it cleaned up so much of the, so many of the abuses that were happening. Um, so this is the point where, you know, I've given you the history, and then, you know, this is something, because maybe all of you go to different types of churches, different traditions, this is a wonderful thing to talk about your pastor, with your pastor and your family, you know, which branch of this do you belong to, because it didn't stay long just being Lutherans and Catholics, and there's offshoots, and, and then we have Calvin, but then it just splintered into many, many groups. So, so I urge you to seek out your own traditions history um, and find out where you where you fit in that. And do you agree more with Calvin? Do you agree more with Luther? Do you agree more with Lulu? Um, yeah, that is, that is a good thing to do with your family and your, and your pastor. Um, are there any questions or comments? This is a lot of information and it's kind of a convoluted story. But anyway. Like, when, like, Martin Luther, I think it was, it was, like, in that by friends, like, stuck in the tower, I was mm -hmm. thinking that was, like, really going off, like, and I was, like, really, like, the tons of Oh, yeah. Trapped in the tower. He was, but he did disguise himself and go out. He called himself, it's very, okay, it makes me laugh a little bit, a junker, apparently, was the name, no, it didn't mean junk, it meant sort of like a peddler. So he called himself Junker George. But I can't always say Junker George without laughing. It wasn't meant to be funny. But it just makes me. Junker George. He just disguised this. This, this, this peddler with his past so he could spy on things, you know, and also get out a little well, bit. Like Haley said, said, so he wasn't so stuck in the castle all the time because I'm sure it got me old. Um, I do not think his. Uh, no, he was not long here. Um, next, oh, we do not meet next week. Are we all aware of it? So everything I tell you today, I am going to forget, and I'm going to say for next week, but you know what I mean, two weeks from now. Next week is code for the next time I see you. Um, so for the next time I see you, please read chapters, oh, just chapter 14. We're going to go back to England. We talked a little bit about Henry, but we talked more about politics, but his reformation got into the politics. So now we're going to go back and talk again about him starting his own church because when you can't get a divorce from your wife, apparently you start your own church. And your first act, give yourself a divorce. Um, that's what Henry did. So read that for next time. Um, last time, I asked you guys to start a keeper. Um, I want to talk about that briefly, and then I want to spend the rest of our time talking about the two talents. Um, some of you, I looked at your outline um, just to remind us what this looks like I will put that you shouldn't need when I want you to write something down I will tell you okay because some of this you've already written down um, so we have an introduction and then we have paragraph two paragraph three and paragraph four which you already should have an outline for and, and many of them I already looked at. And in, yes, Nathan, I, um, so this paper, there's a paper in the back that like tells us how like they do Yes. And, um, yeah, in the appendix, in 90 something, oh, 80 something, 70 something, like I'm bidding. But I'm bidding in here. 73. All right. <laughs> do you want me to mention that again? Uh, uh, do you have a question about it? Um, no, I just I just kind of forgot what I had to put in the intro. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? I'm really glad Nathan mentioned it. Let's let's take a look. Everybody turn to page 73 in your reading guide. Everybody. Um, I win. 
I had to ask you guys, this is just gonna, um, I had to ask you guys, just to recap what the assignment is. You are choosing two characters from the Lord of the Rings. Preferably characters that have some similarities, but also some differences, right? So we mentioned the fact that Mary and Pippin are not very different from each other. It might be really hard to contrast them. But a, a pair like Gandalf and Saruman are really good because they're both wizards. Yeah. Yeah, but sure they go know. different directions. Or we talked a lot about last week about Legolas and Gimli, how their tastes, are you guys with me? Their personal tastes are very different, but they come to have a very close friendship. Is there a I'm going to wait until the know, issues are there. Um, so I want you to, in the first body paragraph, choose one of these characters, the two that you've chosen, and tell me a little bit about them. And on page 73, I have given you a list of things to talk about. So at the top of 73, where it says literary analysis, analysis topic and character, it says qualities. Choose from the list of character qualities on, it says page 164, that's a lie. It's on the next page. Character qualities, loyalty, meekness, obedience, thriftiness, responsibility, endurance, flexibility, forgiveness. Okay, there's many more. What character displays this quality and how do you know? Remember, don't just tell me. Legolas is a loyal friend. Prove it. Show me him being a loyal friend somewhere. Quote him. Or show me an instance where he doesn't abandon someone that he, there's a notable instance, he doesn't abandon someone to torture and death to someone. He chases them until he finds them. Okay, so show me, prove it to me. Uh, what did the character do and why did he do it? That's a very easy thing to talk about. What was the character's effect on the situation or others or himself? Did he change things in any way? Did he change inside of himself? Um, and that's the next one. And what did the character learn? Now, remember what it says here. Choose one or two. You don't have to talk about all of those. That's helpful. Yeah, but, but, but you have a lot of options. Choose ones that seem appropriate for the one you're talking about. Yes, or no. Yes, I would like you to at least say three three things about them. But remember what we're going for. Don't just tell me. Prove it. Saruman was evil. Well, what did he do? Tell me. Yeah, and you, that doesn't mean you have to write Saruman's life story, right? But but do be specific. Then in the next paragraph, you're choosing the other character, and you're doing the same thing. And for most of you, you've already, you showed me, you have an outline already. In, and then in the third, we're comparing and contrasting those two um, characters. In what ways are they the same? In what ways are they different? Be specific. This is your, this is going to be the, the catchphrase of this paper. Be specific. If you say a character is a certain way or did a certain thing, show me. Point it out. Yeah. Show are there a conclusion? We are. We are. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk about um, the introduction and the conclusion. Now I'm going to write down stuff that you should write down. Now we start that. What goes in your introduction? First of all, what do you mean, character or topic? Yes. I will. Um, well, in this case, we don't really have three main topics. What do we have? We have two characters. So somewhere in your introduction, you need to mention the two characters you are describing. Somewhere they need to be in your introduction. Also, you need to tell me what in the world book we're talking about. What is the title of this book? Who is its author? Tell me. By the way, I think that many of you don't know this rule because it's been popping up. They'll tell you. When you 
writes the title of a book, you either, here's my title, you either underline it, or if you're typing, I guess you can kind of do it. You do the italics thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. But no, 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 no. Uh, uh, on the quotation mark. You do <laughs> This is Gamble's mocking me. No, no, <laughs> I agree. Strongly. Yeah. You know, I have a book at home that's misused quotation marks. It's fine. Where people are like, fresh fruit. Yeah. Like, wait, wait, fresh fruit. Um, so we don't use quotation marks for emphasis, as the weird Al song word crime tells us. Um, so either either underline it or italicize it. If you're typing, this is both are easy when you're typing. If you're handwriting, it's easier to underline it. Okay, that's the dike. So also, what is it always good to start our papers with? Awesome. Before that, grab yes, if we can't grab the attention of our audience, we're not going to read to our points, Lauren. So how about an attention getter? Like, give me an attention getter. Here are some options. We've been doing this for a while. Yeah. A quote. A quote. A oh, no. what else? A question. A command. A extremely brief story, aka an anecdote. A very, very brief story, like a couple of two, three sentences, not the entire first page. Um, I am not going to ask you to summarize the book because A, it's two books, two and a half, one and a half books so far that we've read. This is a whopping fun to summarize. Second of all, you uh, may assume that I, I wrote a book, okay? But I would like you to tell me what book are we discussing and, um, and who are the two characters you're talking about. So make sure you have this written down somewhere. This is what I want to see in your introduction. If you've done that, then you, you got it. In your conclusion, I would like you to restate the two characters that you discussed. Now, Try to be creative. In other words, in your introduction, you could say, today I am going to discuss Legolas and Gimli. All right, well, you did what I asked you to do. That's a complete sentence, a bit a boring sentence. You could say, among the many characters in The Lord of the Rings, Legolas and Gimli are the most interesting. And their friendship developed. Okay, you've snuck in the fact that you're going to write about Legolas and Gimli, but you've done it in an interesting way to me. Does that make sense? And then we have to do it again here. This is what we probably don't want to do. In this paper, I talked about Legolas and Gimli. Yes, you did. I know, because I just read your paper. You don't really have to tell me that. I know you did. But maybe you could say, as you can see, the friendship of Legolas and Gimli is a highlight of this book trilogy. Thanks, Miss You may freely. Anything I say may be stolen. I will not really sue. Do you have to turn no, it off? it's not stealing anymore. It may be used with free permission. Yeah, I use that no copyright. Now, this is the thing that is the hardest. Well, once you have this done, which you kind of do if you've got an outline. You pretty much have this already. You just got to turn it into the paper. This is the hard thing. Usually the hard thing is my who cares and why, right? The why does this matter? Why should we care? Um, here's what I'd like you to say. Write this down. I don't know if you can see, but I'll say it. I'll say it. All right. This, okay, it's going to be something like this. This story helps me to mm, fill in the blanks by showing me. Mm. It doesn't have to be worded exactly like that. Let me give you an example. 
The friendship of Legolas and Gimli moves me because sometimes I meet people that I am very different from and I think I could never be really friends with that person. But then I'm reminded that that's the idea. I didn't use the same exact words. Or um, the examples of Saruman and Gandalf show me that we have to be really careful to walk in the truth. Because Saruman, even though he was so wise, was deceived and went off the rails. And I don't want to do that. You see? So paraphrase that in some way. This example, this thing I'm talking about, shows me something. Make it personal for you. I would like you to write this over break. If you start and you don't know what to do, I'm not going anywhere. Just send me an email or call me and say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and I will tell you, okay? Don't forget, we're putting all our figures of speech in. So, and consider yourself lucky. I'm going to add a new one. And you know what? I just forgot yesterday. You guys reap the benefits of my <coughs> stupidity yesterday. But we are going to do the ones we've been doing. Both parallelism, parallelisms one and two. We have a strong verb. <coughs> we have a simile, and we have alliteration. I'm not asking you to put one in every paragraph. If you put one in the paper, but if you want to go crazy, you can put it in every paragraph. You want to. We'll not stop you. I'm not asking you to. Are there any, is there anything I've left out? Are there any questions, some big hole in my instructions that I don't see? Are we good? You want me to leave that up there for a while, Xander? So you, you should have the, the outline. If you want me to look at your outline later, tell me. If you have an outline and you feel good about it, no worries. But what, jot down the stuff that's going in the introduction and conclusion. And I will scoot myself over. Okay, you can see it. Um, Okay, going once, going twice. Any writing questions? All right. Okay, let's talk about the two towers. <clears throat> oh, um, can, can, can you pass this along to Xander before I forget? <laughs> and everyone reads it. Okay, so I know, I know. Xander's now been outed. The moment I hand it over, I'm like, okay, everybody's going to read my comments to Xander. Fortunately, everybody got really nice comments. So I, I really enjoyed everybody's. Um, I had one on my on my and I. Everything else, but okay. it was a good, a beautiful job. I had a Farrah White. White. I spelled that wrong. Farrah White. White is not white as a ghostly specter is not a word we frequently use in everyday conversation. You don't run into white very but often. I learned a new word. word. Halcyon. No. Yeah. Yeah. Halcyon. I looked up synonyms. You're looking for the. Yes. Halcyon. I'm not sure about the Harry. Oh, because it's Harry. Yeah. Okay. 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 So I marked a couple of things that I wanted to talk about, and I I mentioned this just in my little sentences you can feel freely about Saruman. Saruman was really wise. What was Saruman's I don't know, day job? What's his what's his status? Who is Saruman? I mean, before, like from time immemorial, not just in the story. What is his position? Wizard? He's a wizard. Is he just is he just any wizard? Uh he's Saruman the White and he's bad. Okay, but was he always bad? No. no. What, what does being the white make you think about him? Purity. Purity and goodness. And so, um, is he just equal to all the other wizards? No. What is his position among them? He's above. He's above and beyond. What did you want to say here? Um, I was going to say that he's like a fellow wizard, but he's like different, kind of like. Oh, I can't think of the name right now. He's he's the head of the council. He's the head of the council of wizards. So when the wizards get together, he's in charge. How 
Mm. I'm not sure what answer I'm going to get, but I'm going to ask anyway. How does a person get to be in charge? What are some ways that a person... Okay, money, but not in this case. We have no Smartness. Smartness. Presumably, we pick someone who will wisely lead us. Can you think of another reason? Able to manipulate. Be able to manipulate. This is another. And it is unclear in this story if Saruman was just really wise and they put him in charge or if he was manipulating all that time ago and they put him in charge. Yeah. Is that what this bolt? Because. Uh, me and John were reading the big game of course, and the way that the character got in control was they used really big words, made themselves seem smart, made the others seem dumb, so they thought that Napoleon. Was right. he was yes, smart. the pig. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, so, so we do not know how how long has Saruman been bad, but we we do get some hints. And let me read this paragraph to you. A strong place and wonderful was Isengard, and long it had been beautiful. And there great lords had dwelt, the wardens of Gondor upon the west, and wise men that watched the stars. But Saruman had slowly shaped it to his shifting purposes, and made it better, as he thought, being deceived. For all those arts and subtle devices for which he forsook his former wisdom, and which fondly he imagined were his own, came but from mortal, so that what he made was not only a little copy, a child's model or a slave's flattery of that vast fortress, armory, prison, furnace of great power, bar dur the dark tower, which suffered no rival, and laughed at flattery, biding its time, securing its pride, and its immeasurable strength. Right in one paragraph, we met our two towers. But listen to the words that Tolkien uses. He forsook his former wisdom. Was he wise once upon a time? Yeah. Yeah, apparently. If he forsook wisdom he formerly had, then once he had it. He has nothing now. He has nothing now, and he has been deceived. All the ideas that come to Saruman's mind, where do they really come from? Mordor. Mordor. But he doesn't know it. He thinks he's his. He thinks it's his idea. This just sounds like Emperor Palpatine. That's what, because this sort of story is a great story. The evil mastermind that puppet masters other people to do their mm -hmm. bidding. Sauron is a master. Now, Saruman is also a master. What is Saruman's biggest weapon? Do we find out? What do you think? Here? Have you read the book? Um, or you just... Is it like the Recorded thing? Yeah. No. Is that no. the book or no? No. Is it the rain that he has? No. He doesn't have uh, one of the rain. Daylight or color Nope. There's a chapter called it. It's his voice. It's his voice. Sorry, Hans. Oh, yeah. Okay. His voice. We have a chapter called The Voice of Saruman. So remember, Saruman is toast. Well, not completely. The Ents have done their work very well. They have flooded Isengard, and they have drowned all of his machinery and his genetic manipulation of orcs and all this weird scientific stuff he's doing. And he's holed up in Orthanc with Wormtongue, of all people, to be stuck in a tower with. That just sounds... Well, I'm not sure which one has the raw deal, whether I would want to be Wormtongue stuck with Saruman or Saruman stuck with Wormtongue. Either way. Um, but they approach to talk. By the way, why does Gandalf even bother? Why, why doesn't he just say to the Ents, guard him when he comes out because he's starving, kill him? Why does he bother? Or what do you think? Okay, A, because Gandalf's nice. Uh, you know, this is not how we treat enemies. If we're the good guys, we don't just, you don't take out the people who are down and out, right? It's bad form. Do you, do you have another reason, Adrian? Um, no, but I do want to, is Sauron dead? 
I didn't say Saruman then. Not, not Saruman. 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 Did I say Saruman accidentally? Yeah, I did too. But like, I didn't think he died, did he? To uh, whenever Wormtongue tried to kill him. That's just the movie. No, just that. That did not happen. That forget everything you saw in the movie about Saruman. I didn't see. Oh, okay. Okay. I no. actually didn't see. Saruman is not dead, and yeah, Saruman is and Wormtongue is not trying to kill. That this that's a botch. I thought it was the ball. Yeah. You know, I threw down the ball and then hit the rail and it just yeah. floated and left me on my ball. He did. But he tried to kill. Try to. Do you want to try to push it down on Saruman? No, he tried to push it down on Gandalf. Oh. He, you know, they're standing up above, oh. and he just chucked, he chucked this big ball out at the last, you know, eh, maybe I can hit, bonk one of them on the head on their way as they, as they leave, and then you hear the scream, because he just chucked out the little, you know, FaceTime device that, you know, you can, <laughs> you can talk to other people through, and now, great, now I'm stuck in a tower with worm tongue, and I don't even have a TV. I have nothing. I have nothing. Um, Gandalf says, um, oh, you know what, it might be in the former chapter, and I don't know if I'm going to try to find it. They called him out on it, uh, like Gimli and Lego. Well, why even bother? Why even bother to talk to him? And I'll paraphrase because I can't find it and I don't have the Gandalf says, Saruman was once the leader of our order. Saruman deserves respect. And he may not be wholly ruined. It is possible that he can be reasoned with and may just be the truth. He's his puppet. And you know Sauron will turn on him like a rabbit dog. You know he will. Saruman doesn't know this. Saruman thinks he's going to be in charge. Can you think of another character that Gandalf similarly said, he shouldn't be harmed because he possibly could be redeemed or changed. Oh, sure. Smeagol, Gollum, exactly. Perhaps Gollum does not have to be Gollum forever. Do you remember Gandalf said, even the wise cannot see all it is, right? Maybe there's good left in Saruman. Maybe there's good left in Gollum. So he wants to give him a chance, but they approach, and Gandalf tells them all to be careful. What's the danger, asked Pippin. Will he shoot at us or pour fire out of the windows? Or can he put a spell on us from a distance? The last is most likely if you ride to his door with a light heart, said Gandalf. But there is no knowing what he can do or may choose to try. A wild beast cornered is not safe to approach. And Saruman has powers you do not guess. Beware of his voice. This is the description. I love this paragraph. The window closed. They waited. Suddenly, another voice spoke low and melodious, its very sound an enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words they had heard. If they did, they wondered for a little power remaining. Mostly, they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking, and all that it said seemed wise reasonable and desirable for them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast. And if they gave said the voice, which means they, if they argued against the voice, anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. For some, the spell lasted only while the voice spoke to them. And when it spoke to another, they smiled, as men do who see through a juggler's trick while others escape them. For many, the sound of the voice alone was enough to hold them in thrall. But for those whom it conquered, the spell endured when they were far away. And ever they heard that soft voice whispering and urging them. But none were moved. None rejected its pleas and its commands without an effort of mind and will, so long as its master had control of it. This is frightening. Yes, Haley. I don't know why, but like, and like where the um Scarlet of Zarya the silver chair I think it was. I don't know why, but I really wanted them to like stay the, under the spell for some reason. The princess you know what, the, the, the lady of the green kirtle does the same exact thing. She I gets them I, underground. I wanted them to like and stay she, in the spell. She mesmerizes them. And 
And so Simon can do this, and it's lovely. And this is, I just said one of the things that the movie did poorly. Let's talk about one of the things they did well. Say it in reply. You know, uh, that they show this very well in the movie. So Sarma is talking to say it is. I'm not talking to all those others. Say they're talking to, to you. Remember what just happened? Uh, remember Helm's Deep a couple chapters ago? Uh, remember mm -hmm. tens of thousands of orcs he sent to burn the lands and then killed a bunch of them in his stronghold and he's had a spy in his employ in Sayadin's household. Remember all that? Oh, but suddenly, say it. Be reasonable. Don't, don't listen to these people who want to turn us against each other. We're friends. We've always been friends. And all these guys around him are We've always been friends. I mean, they forget. They forget. Theoden, bless his heart, does not forget. He says, we will have peace. Yeah, when you paid for everything you stole, we will have peace. When you make amends for everybody you just killed, we will have peace. When you hang from a gibbet, from a gallows, so your crows can eat you, we will have peace. Thayden calls himself a lesser son of greater sires at one point. He says, my fathers were better than me. But Thayden is awesome in that moment. Maybe, you know, we don't know what Thayden's going to do later in the book, so I don't want to say anything. But this is one of his shining moments. He sees through the Malvarki. And he breaks the spell. As soon as he, everybody's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's the guy who does all that bad stuff, isn't he? He's the guy we hate. He's the guy we want to take down. Saruman's voice. When we have the power to persuade people with words, it's, it's a perilous power. You know? So, what, you know, we're working on writing, our writing skills, and I, I would aspire, I want to be a better writer. We're all learning together to be better writers. But, you know, when you get to be a really good talker or writer, you have a lot of power. And so, you know, when we have the ability to persuade people with words, some of you are really super good with words. Some of you, the words just flow out of you. You're good with it. Be careful. Be careful, because we're responsible for what we do. Saruman knows exactly what he's doing. He's very good with words, but he's also, he's also enchanted. Yeah, he's magical, what does everyone say? He's, he's, got, he's got wizard powers uh, in his voice. Um, so we started the second half of the two towers this week, and we finally went back to Frodo and, and Sam. All of the first half of the book has only been what is happening to Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli. Finally, we get to double back and say, what has Frodo and Sam been doing all this time? Yes, sir. Um, I did not like how the movie just completely Cut out. Oh, you mean went back and forth? No, no, no. I like. I kind of like how they went back and forth. They like. They never met Gondor. The people of Gondor. Who, who did? Who did? Oh, uh, Frodo. No. Well, they they did in the. I don't know what you're referring to. Um, in the you and the. Okay, are you saying? No, I'm just. I want to understand. Are you saying something happened in the book that didn't happen in the movie? Yes. What happened in the book? Um, they met the people of Gondor. Uh, uh, Faramir? Yes. Okay. Did that not happen in the movie? I don't oh, know. I, I, I can explain. Okay, right, so, in the Fellowship of, it's weird, in the Fellowship of the Ring, book one and book two are in the movie, mm -hmm. in the Two Towers, only book three is in the movie, and in the Return of the King movie, uh, Two Towers, book four, mm -hmm. and book five, and book six are all in one movie. So, oh. if you watch Return of the King, then you'll find Frodo and Sam's oh, okay. big adventures with. Oh, okay. I oh, see. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Zach. I was failing to, to know that you hadn't watched the group. Um, okay, you haven't read that part yet, so we're not going to go there. Um, we're going to wait until after you read the rest of the two towers. Um, but they, he does. He does meet them in the movie. Um, so let's, let's go back to Frodo and Sam before they meet. Um, Um, I want to read this part. So Gollum has been following them forever, right? Remember they're going through Moria 
and you hear the patter, 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 patter. Frodo hears it. He's not sure anybody else hears it. I just think he doesn't know what it is. They get to Loch Orion, and something creeps up the tree, and the elves come back and say, I don't know what that thing was, but something we don't know what it was was creeping around, and then it slunk away, and it's pretty good if you can escape from elves, because elves are, you know, elves are good. Elves are good hunters. Okay. Um, and finally, finally he caught up to them. Um, and I love the fact that this, this chapter is called The Taming. The Taming of Sneagle. It remains to be seen whether Sneagle is tameable. But Gandalf already was. Gandalf said he was redeemable. But listen to this. Um, and now, said Frodo, if we kill him, we must kill him outright. But we can't do that not as things are. Poor wretch. He's done us no harm. Oh, hasn't he? said Sam, rubbing his shoulder. Anyway, he meant to, and he means to, I'll warrant. Throttle us in our sleep, that's plenty. I dare say, said Frodo. But what he means to do is another matter. Let me stop. I, I, don't, I don't want to read more, but let me stop there. Can we punish people for things we think they're going to do? No. If it's Why not? If you know that it is, if I break in and you've got, I don't know, probably not you. We'll, we'll not put it off on one of you. It'll be somebody that none of us knows, right? And they have stockpiled weapons and bombs. Okay. Are we pretty sure they're going to hurt someone? Yes. Like I'm not 9.986% sure. They're going to hurt someone, but have they done it yet? So what can the law charge them with? Well, trespassing. That would be me. I just broke into their room and found them. You have a search warrant. Yeah, we have a search warrant. But anyway, we're talking about not what you can charge me with. What can I charge them with? What have they done illegal? You know, Haley? Isn't it like holding up weapons? Well, having illegal weapons. Yeah. Like there are certain weapons that it's illegal for private people to have. Certain types of guns, certain types of weapons. But you can't charge them with blowing up the city. They didn't do it, right? You can't charge people with things they haven't done. Gollum, has Gollum tried to kill them? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. No, not yet. I mean, they didn't really give him a chance. No. You know what I mean? They pounced on him the moment <laughs> he yeah. came near, and then they tied the elven rope on him, and he didn't like that. And they tried to feed him one boss and didn't like that either. Um, but, but they didn't, he didn't do anything but follow them. Is it illegal to follow someone? No, there are no stalker laws in the woods. We're gonna say. We're gonna say. Um, it's not. It's not illegal to follow someone, and he hasn't done anything wrong. So here's the dilemma: they know he means to do wrong, but he hasn't done it yet. And Frodo and Sam are the good guys. Remember, we just talked about the fact that Gandalf can't just let them execute Saruman. He has done bad things. And they still, um, they still want to give him a chance to, to make it right. Gollum has done bad things. He hasn't done anything bad to Frodo and Sam. Um, some years ago, a, there was a movie, um, which is not, it's, it's like radar, so don't, don't get this movie. Um, but it was, about, it was about a time in the future when they can see the future. And they have, the people that can see the future can see if somebody's going to commit a crime. So they go and they arrest you before you commit the crime. But you haven't done it yet. And this movie is all about, but, 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 but if you see it in the future, can you change it? Yes. Maybe you could change your mind. How, how irrevocable is that future they see? And not to mention, is it just to punish someone for something that you think they're going to do? Yeah. Uh, Whatever operation that they do in uh, in, in uh, Captain America and the Civil War. I never saw that one. Oh yeah. I object to Captain America. I forgot what it was. They called it, but I don't like them. I don't like the goggles. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but that, that's interesting. You know what? I, my husband and I watched this really stupid movie the other night, but it was about a, 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 like two TV monitors or computer monitors. And if you looked in one of them, you could see two minutes into the future in the other one. 
I don't know. It's very weird. It's Japanese with subtitles. But the point was that when you saw it, and then they put a bunch, like they staggered them, so it was like one of those mirrors where you can see back and forth, so they could see way in the future. The point of it was, if I see it in the monitor, can I change it? Yeah, you know, this is this is an old this is an old sci-fi theoretical uh, uh, storyline that gets used as a plot in a lot of cases. But in this case, Gollum, even though they have high suspicion, he hasn't done it yet. And Frodo says, first of all, we can't torture him little by little because we don't do that sort of thing. Second of all, we if we're going to kill him, we have to just kill him and get it over with and not let him suffer. But how can we? He hasn't done anything wrong. So let me read. I'm going to pick up where I left off. Let me keep reading. He paused for a while and thought. Gollum lay still but stopped whimpering, Samson glowering over him. It seemed to Frodo the thin, thin that he heard, quite plainly, the far off voices out of the past. Pity Bilbo did not stab the vile creature when he had a chance. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy. Not to strike without need. I do not feel any pity for Gollum. He deserves death. Deserves death. I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death. And some die that deserve blood. Can you give it to me? Then be not too eager to deal out death in the name of justice, fearing for your own safety. Even the wise cannot see all in. Very well, he answered aloud, lowering his sword. But still I am afraid, and yet... As you see, I will not touch the creature. For now that I see him, I see him. Frodo is thoroughly good. And he treats Gollum as well as he possibly could. Does that mean Frodo's stupid? You know? Can you be can you be innocent? Okay, innocent of wrongdoing and innocent sort. I don't know how to describe it. You know, somebody who gives the benefit of the doubt to others. That sort of person. Can you be that sort of person and at the same time be wise yeah. about it? Can, can you think of somewhere in the Bible where instructed to be just that way? Be as innocent as doves. Be as wise as serpents. You know, the first, okay, I don't even, now I'm going back into the Stone Age, but a lot of people watch this. Andy Griffith. Oh, <laughs> yes. yes. Andy Griffith is super good, but he's not stupid. Barney, every time somebody comes into Mayberry, right, like the, 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 the con artist or whatever, Barney just falls. Barney has issues. But Andy, Andy is, is, is innocent. He's he's the proof guilt proof innocent until proven guilty sort for everybody. But he's not an idiot and he sees what's going on. Right? He sees it way before Barney ever does. And and then usually saves Barney. Um so listen to this exchange with Frodo and Gollum. Because Go Frodo said I'm staring at what they try to see him. They they try. But Gollum says, I will lead, I will lead the master of the of the precious. Frodo says, What what how can you promise? What promise can you give that I trust? Because Frodo's not stupid. Like I said, he knows this is not a trustworthy creature. He swears upon the precious. Serve the master of the precious. For Gollum, this is huge. There's nothing in his universe more important than liberty. Listen to what Frodo says. Um, I warn you, Smeagol, you are in danger. Yes, yes, Master, said Gollum, dreadful danger. Smeagol bone and shake to think of it, but he doesn't run away. You must help my friend. I did not mean the danger that we all share, said Frodo. I mean a danger to yourself alone. You swore a promise by what you called precious. Remember that. It will hold you to it, but it will seek a way to twist it to your own undoing. Already you are being twisted. You revealed yourself to me just now foolishly. Give it back to Smeagol, he said. Do not say that again. Do not let that thought grow in you. You will never get it back. But the desire of it may betray you to a bitter end. 
you will never get it back. When you ask me to giggle, I should put on the precious. And the precious master of you long ago, if I wearing it were to command you, you would obey. Even if it were to leap from a precipice or to cast yourself into the fire. And such would be my command. That kid's giggle. Frodo's not a duke, is he? You better straighten up and fly on because I'll come in to this point. Oh, <laughs> Frodo is not blind. Nice. But, but see, but he's innocent. I love this because he's innocent as a dog and swan as a serpent, right? I mean, it's nice, kind of. He's like, if you do this, I won't make you kill yourself. But if you don't, then I'm going to. Yeah, yeah. And I'm giving you every opportunity. I'm giving you every opportunity because now that I see you, I do see you. All right, I want you guys over break to finish the two towers. If you have already finished it, or if you've just got extra time because of break, you can start Return of the King. It's no crime to read ahead. Just make it at least to the end of the two towers by the time that we finish break. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in two weeks. Remember, I've got these paintings right now if you want to look at them. Otherwise, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye, guys. Oh, yeah, I'll go home.